Howard snapped at one point and just said, I'm sick of this. He threw every four-letter word out there. He also threw all the pool chairs into the pool and everything, and then he stormed out and left. And he intended to quit the band. Oh, we're totally booked. Rock and roll! Well, I think I'll leave you to your reading. Little hands says it's time to rock and roll. Rock and roll out! We are totally booked. Welcome back to Booked on Rock, the podcast for those about to read and rock. Online at bookedonrock.com, where you can find every episode along with links to listening platforms, exclusive videos, blogs, and the latest rock book releases. Mark Arnold and Charles F. Rosney are returning guests to the podcast. Their brand new book is titled Not Just Happy Together, The Turtles from A to Z, AM Radio to Zappa. Discover the songs and the history of one of the most successful pop rock bands ever, The Turtles, who had countless top 40 hits, including It Ain't Me Babe, Let Me Be, You Baby, She'd Rather Be With Me, You Know What I Mean, She's My Girl, Eleanor, You Showed Me, and of course, the iconic Happy Together. Authors Mark Arnold and Charles F. Rosney have joined forces to cover the entire careers of The Turtles from their early days as the Crossfires through their hit-filled years into their breakup that led to most of the Turtles members joining forces with Frank Zappa's Mothers of Invention, to Mark Volman and Howard Kalin's years as solo artists under the guise of Flo and Eddie, and even their forays into children's records. Mark and Charles are here to talk about all of it in this episode. A playlist of the Turtles, Flo and Eddie, and more can be found on the show notes page. Mark Arnold, Charles Rosnay, welcome back, guys. Great to see you again. Great to see you, Eric. Thanks for having us. Well, here we are with a book on the turtles. And it's not just the turtles, though, which is cool. You cover pre- and post-turtles. So tell us what fans can expect in this book, Not Just Happy Together, the Turtles from A to Z, AM Radio to Zappa. They can expect a lot of silly rapportee between Mark and myself in print. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) The end. (laughs) Oh, we want to sell the book. We better tell them some more. Yes. <laughs> tell us more. It's uh, divided into different sections. There's a turtle section, has a complete history. Then it has our comments. Uh, second section about Zappa and their time with them and uh, our comments. And then the third section is Flo and Eddie Solo and their comments. And then uh, the children's record section that they did because they did a number of children's albums. And then the fifth section is uh, all the many interviews Charles and I conducted over the last three years. Really proud of those because we got to a lot of people. And I think we probably uh, included Howard Kalen from what we know, the last interview he's given. We'd like to think that it's a pretty complete and comprehensive discography and book on the Turtles. But there's a lot of personality to it, too. If someone is a, a diehard Turtles fan, well, they're going to love every word, every sentence. And if there's someone who knows the band and just thinks, wow, yeah, sure, we know Happy Together, maybe one or other, one, two other songs, they're going to get the deep, the deep uh, dive. They're going to realize that this band is, wow, how come they weren't, you know, up there with every phenomenal band of the 60s? Why isn't the world recognized? Why are they not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? <laughs> That's where I come from. That's the aspect I'm coming from. I know about the Turtles, of course. I know a few of the hits here and there, but I was blown away at how many hit songs that they had and the body of work. And not just with the Turtles, but Flo and Eddie and the the whole thing. So it it actually made me more of a fan after reading the book. If you could take us back to the start of the 60s, give us a brief backstory of how the Turtles formed. And no, they were not a British band. Their story begins in Westchester, California. They started in high school, believe it or not. They weren't the the Turtles then, but uh, four of the band members that eventually made the Turtles were in a school choir together. And this was at Westchester High School down in Southern California. One thing led to another, and they started out as a surfing band. They had a couple different names. The most famous name that stuck was the Crossfires. And they managed to get out a couple seven inch singles during that time this is, we're talking 1963 64 era on some very very small labels but they got some traction on the radio at that time in the local area san bernardino and stuff like that down in southern california then they got to be the regular performers at a local club bar type thing and at one point the owners they were impressed with their work they came up to them and basically said hey 
we're going to be your managers. And so they said, okay. <laughs> and one of the first things they suggested, because the Beatles had just hit, we're going to change your name. And they were thinking of different names, like the six pack and the half dozen and stuff like that. And they go, nope, you're going to be the turtles. And they said, the turtles, it's slow, fat creatures. Yeah. <laughs> and then they said, no, no, no. You know, the turtles would be a good thing because you'll be confused for a British band and everybody will think you'd be coming over well, with all those other animals and <laughs> similar type name. And it worked, you know, they were confused and they started getting bigger and bigger bookings nationwide bookings and they got signed to a larger label not the greatest label but white whale their breakthrough single was the cover of a bob dylan song it ain't me babe from 1965 reached number eight and there's a funny bob dylan story attached to this song right they bob <laughs> dylan said hey i think you sh you guys should record that <laughs> well he heard it he's great he loved the verse he didn't realize it was his own song but i like to say the beatles gave us yeah 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 and the turtles gave us no, no, no. Yeah, you say you put that in the book. <laughs> that was a, 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 a foreshadowing of, you know, great hits to come. The vocals are great. The arrangement is great. I mean, you know, I think it, I, I'm someone who's a Dylan fan will say, oh man, it's not, you know, like uh, honest to his, his version. I think it's better. I mean, I, I want a song that's, you know, infectious and, and has a chorus and you're going to sing along to, I love their version of it. Yeah. That first album, which they also called it ain't me, babe. You know, they did a lot of Dylan covers on that. They did like a Rolling Stone and things like that. So, you know, they, they basically picked the cream of the crop of like what was, considered folk rock at that time and uh, made it their own you know it, you know that's the cool thing about the turtles is whenever they did a cover they didn't just do it like dylan or something they made it their own you know they they sang it howard sang it in his own way in his own voice and the instrumentation by the band was incredible so the lineup of the turtles we should mention too mark volman howard kalen are the most well-known hey, members but hey, who hey, else who else was in well, the band? Well, in those early days, I have to always look it up because I always forget. I got, <laughs> I got to hear too. Al Nickel, uh, Jim Tucker. Yeah, so it, it, Al Nickel was a constant. He was always in the group too, along with Howard and Mark. But there's always like a revolving door of the, the other one. But the early ones were Chuck Ports, Don Murray, and James Tucker. Those were okay. the early, that was the early six. And then it was like uh, Johnny Barbato. Oh, I, yeah, and the, uh, yeah, Chuck Ports. Yeah, yeah, I said that one. Ports was bass. Howard yeah. lead vocals, keyboards, Don Murray drums, Mark Volman guitar, vocals, Jim Tucker rhythm guitar, and then Al Nickel lead guitar, keyboards. Right. And all these guys were also in the Crossfires. They were also all in high school together. So, I mean, they were young guys. They were younger than the Beatles were when they first started out, mid-teens, you know. They were a true boy band. <laughs> What's interesting though, that second album doesn't do well. You, you Baby, you baby. Yeah. from 1966 mm -hmm. didn't chart, and you give an honest assessment of the book. That's the thing about this book, too. You don't sugarcoat, you just you tell it like it is. You are, and if it's not a hit, it's not a hit. If it's right? not, it's yeah. So, why didn't it succeed? I always think it's because White Whale wasn't the strongest label, and they were more of a singles label. You know, there's a lot of labels that were known over the years you know you know them like stacks and bolt and things like that that they're known for their singles they're not really known for their albums i mean history you know later on you look back and i go well that's a great otis redding album but at the time people were not buying albums as much they're buying sitting on the dock of the bay or something like that so it's the same with the turtles they weren't necessarily buying it ain't me babe album some were because it obviously charred. But when You Baby came along, you know, it, apparently more people bought the You Baby single and the Let Me Be single than the album. And I think we got to blame if blame is to be put. And it's not the buying public. And it's not because there weren't, you know, great songs uh, on some of these albums that didn't sell. But the label, the label wasn't pushing an album. It was pushing singles. That's what it knew. And it knew that if it had, you know, one single, great, we'll sell a million of them. And then hopefully, you know, the album will sell 10,000 because it's on that album. But they come back and they come back big with Happy Together in 1967. Their biggest commercial success reached number 25. The song Happy Together, number one single. So a question for each of you guys. Charles, you write, quote, how could any act have ever passed on recording this 
But that's what happened, and not just once or twice. Tell us about the the history of this song, Happy Together. So this song was being shopped. I mean, it was, you know, written, and and the writers thought they had a hit, but no act really was able to grasp it and turn it and work it and put the what was needed and uh, the turtles did i mean they thought yeah we could this could be a hit we think this has potential and it needed whatever magic that turtles Flo and Eddie, Mark and, and Howard, whatever the magic they added was what was needed in the arrangement. And no, don't forget, this is not outside, you know, musicians who are coming in like the wrecking crew and saying, oh, yeah, let, let's add this hi hat and let's, you know, maybe a, this kind of a bass line and a, a, a Spanish guitar intro. This was them. It was them in the studio. It was them working out the arrangement, the way they wanted to be, the way they wanted to sound, and the way they want it released. And so I really think that what was probably a negative in, in many ways at the time turned out to be a positive because studio musicians might have come in, you know, Hal Blaine and and, and uh, Tedesco and some of those people, Glenn Campbell, who knows if you know the ones who played on the Beach Boys and they played on Mamas and the Papas and they played on the Monkees. So if this was a band that was on a different label those people might have come in and you might have had a completely different sound and a different arrangement. And it might not have been that how I think they might have rejected it too. Everything (laughs) everything about the released version of happy together by the turtles with the, with the lineup they had was just perfection. Mark, you have an interesting quote in the book regarding cover versions of the song. One in particular you see, it's really difficult to ruin a song like this. That's how great it is. But John Davidson and Lucy Arnaz try really hard to accomplish that feat by singing it together on the January 29th, 1973 episode of Here's Lucy. I'm, I'm afraid to listen now. Is it that bad? Yeah. Well, you know what's funny is uh, that quote came from because I was, I, we've been working on this book for over three years. Okay. Wow. I'm also a big TV nut. And so I love watching old sitcoms on DVD, especially shows. Where, like, here's Lucy. I remember when it was on. I didn't watch it every week. You know, I just watch it occasionally. When the DVDs come out, I'm watching all of them. It's like binge watching. That's what I watch. I don't watch the the latest hit show. I'm watching old garbage from 20, 30 years ago. But anyway, somewhere along the line, and I probably was working on this book at the time, that episode comes up and they start singing Happy Together. And I'm going, oh, my God, this is awful. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it, John Davidson funny. was a singer, to be honest. I mean, yeah. I remember <laughs> Hollywood Squares. And then my dad had the Firestone Christmas album with all the various singers on it. Like, yeah, he he sang a, few, a couple <laughs> Disney movies and things like that. Yeah. But later on, you know, he's known for talk shows and other things. And yeah. he, also, <laughs> he also toured in uh, Sound of Music. Wow. So he, he was considered a singer, but perhaps not on this one track. I disagree with you guys. As as bad as, you know, versions that have come out since by even the worst singers, this song is still the song. It's still a great yeah. song. And if it's based on the Turtles version, I still will love it. I mean, I can't sing and I sing and I go, boy, that's a great song. <laughs> <laughs> it's that well, good. As proof of its longevity, there's a new show or current show called FBI. It's not the old Ephraim Zimbalist FBI. It's a new show. They used Happy Together, not the Turtles version, but they used Happy Together to promote it, saying new episodes coming up. And in the background, imagine me and you. Yeah, you I mean, it's you a know, time it's song. Like, yeah. That's it again. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's in so many movies. So many. It's in so many soundtracks. It's incredible. And it's written by Gary Bonner and Alan Gordon. We should talk about these guys. Who are Gary Bonner and Alan Gordon? And how did they team up with the Turtles? There's another song, hit song they write, which is She'd Rather Be With Me, number three single. So those two songs. Let me tell you a little bit that we haven't mentioned. You know, this is why people were rejecting it. Uh, I have never heard the demo. It might exist on YouTube, but I'd love to hear it. Apparently, they did the demo on the really cheap you know, so they were just slapping their knees going, imagine me, you know, <laughs> like that. And it's like, nobody could see that this was a hit. But they, you know, we were talking about the original band members. By the time Happy Together was made, Barbada, Johnny Barbada came in and was the new drummer. Chip Douglas came in and he was also a bass player, but yeah. also a producer. Yeah. So, you know, together he was listening with all this and 
they played Happy Together many, many times in concert before they recorded it. They kind of did like what the Marx Brothers used to do on the early films, is that they would perform it on stage and from in front of an audience and fine-tune it and everything. So by the time that they recorded this thing, it was a basically a guaranteed hit. Yeah, great call. As you mentioned, you know, the two composers, it's not just She'd Rather Be Me, but they did a lot. Of, there's other Turtle songs that they covered, but... And I think I say it in the book, they don't have that magic. They don't have that spark. They don't have the infectious hooks that she'd rather be with me and um, and Happy Together did. You know, they caught Magic in a Bottle for those two songs and not, not really a lot of others. Did they write songs for a lot of other bands and acts, those two guys? I, I know they wrote Goodbye Surprise, which was supposed to be on the Turtles' last album, which was not completed. And then when Flo and Eddie did their first solo album, they re-recorded it. Unfortunately, the Flo and Eddie name wasn't as marketable as the Turtles name, even in 1972. And so, you know, the album just basically stiffed, you know, but there's some excellent stuff on there and stuff from Bonner and Gordon. The Turtles present the Battle of the Bands. This was released in 1968, the follow-up to Happy Together. Only reached 128 in the U.S., but 43 on the U.S. cash box chart. It's, it's a concept album. A really cool concept. Tell me about the concept, but also you both feel the record label White Whale didn't market this one the right way either. Oh, no, they fa they failed. Big F on that one. You know, we have the Beatles Pepper and you have uh, Stones, Her Majesty's Mother's Invention, Freak Out. So many albums are um, concept albums and, and the Turtles were a product of their time, obviously, and they wanted to put out an album that showed a lot more of their colors, a lot more of their flavors. And in this concept album, they were all these different bands with all these different styles. And most of them hit, most of them were great. But for some reason, you know what, they, was it the label again? The album did not do as well as it could. And that's an interesting, you mentioned Cashbox. It charted much, much higher than Billboard. And I wonder if one had more of a sales impact. I'm trying to remember what was the difference is why there would be that much a diverse. Uh, of, right. Of, yeah. Remember? I wonder was Cashbox based on, yeah. How did they differentiate the two charts? Uh, one of them obviously is airplay on radio, but Cashbox would be sales. More sales. I yeah. think. Yeah. But that wouldn't make sense because the album didn't sell that. It wasn't being picked up like the Gary Puckett albums of the time. So it's it, that doesn't make sense. So I never really understood. Um, and if I did a chart analysis, maybe I did, a, you know, figured out across the board why. and Because if you look at so many of the billboards where, where it was something was number 80 and then on Cashbox, well, it was 85 or 76. It was always much closer for this particular album, that that was a gigantic differentiation. It doesn't make sense. And it's amazing that an album with two top 10 hits wouldn't even get close to the top 10 itself. I mean, it had Eleanor and You Showed Me. Yes. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of other songs, of course, you know, but those were the two big hits. And you can't even say that about Sgt. Pepper. There's no single off of that. And, you know, <laughs> you know. Were the numbers on those two singles, how high did they chart, Eleanor and... I think Eleanor me. was like three and uh, You Showed Me was like six, something they like both, that. Or they might wow. have made to six or something like yeah, that, both, but it was a top, top ten. ten. Yeah. Both yeah. Top ten. That's yeah. strange, too, because in those days, well, I guess you could buy 45s, but still, in those that you, you you have two hit singles, people are going to buy the whole album to get the singles. Well, I guess they still didn't do it then. I mean, it's like, uh, at least with White Whale, because I, I think it's, again, White Whale probably had distribution problems when it came to albums. I mean, I, I studied the whole White Whale catalog, and they had a few other hit singles by other acts, but album-wise, the two highest charting albums White Whale ever had was Happy Together at 25, and uh, their golden hits, their oh, first the compilation, hits. was their only top 10. It went to number seven on the charts, and every other act basically didn't chart or was in the lower near 200 <laughs> regions. How did Eric, they sign to White Whale? I mean, what was... Well, who it, it, who it was, was a it? local Los Angeles label. And I think, you know, the, you know, if you watch the Turtles documentary, they trusted everybody, you know. So, you know, the guys that ran the nightclub said, hey, we're your managers. And they go, OK, okay. you yeah. know, <laughs> and so they probably were friends with the guys at the label. And they said, here's your label. OK, yeah. well, it saves um, us the, the trouble of trying to find one. You did it. You know, thanks. Right. You know, 
the first ones who came along. Yeah, I, you, you mentioned the Golden Hits album. And at the time, I remember um, we'd gotten this new fangled item called a cassette player, mm. which was able to now play in a car. Eric, you're too young, so you wouldn't know. Oh, this. oh no, I remember. Yeah, cassettes were my <laughs> cassettes were right in my strike zone. I was born in 72, so. So, but I had obviously everything on vinyl. We had, you know, all the Supremes albums and the Four Seasons and the Beatles and the Monkeys and Gary Puckett, on and on and on. So when we got the cassette, we were going to listen to stuff in the car and it had to be stuff that we didn't already, my parents and I, we didn't already have in vinyl. So the first two out of the box <laughs> were as golden. It's the, the Turtles. And Tom Jones, go figure. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, you in the introduction, you talk about those car rides from... New Haven to New York, right? You were yeah. initially lived in New York. Right. And your mom missed New York. So you'd go and visit family members, right? Correct. Yes. Right. Very good. And uh, so those were, you know, hour and a half, two hour rides, probably closer to two hours because there were tolls along the way back then. And uh, sure enough, we had cassettes and you know, it became Grand Funk and became other things. But the first two I'd ever unwrapped and I found it so weird to, you know, take out the little sleeve and not have a big item with, you know, lyrics and that vinyl to put it in. But the plugging in was so convenient. And though over and over, we, we played every Turtle song. And that's how that's why I fell in love with them. Well, Mark's story I can relate to as well, because I used to go to the local Caldors here in town and you'd look through the bargain bin and you'd you'd look for cassettes. And if it was 99 cents or whatever, it's like, what do I have to lose? You know, and then you discover these these artists. That's the way you discovered the Turtles, right, Mark? Yeah, it it was on a cassette. It was a greatest hits album. It wasn't Golden Hits, but it was, uh, uh, I believe, a, a Mexican pressing called greatest hits and it had like 25 tracks and i go and it was like three bucks or something i said hey i i really only know happy together i think i knew she'd rather be with me i think that was it but i said there's a bunch of stuff on here let's try it out if it's terrible i can just toss it out (laughs) and uh, you know i think i do go through the book song by song my first impression some i liked some i didn't some i loved and i was like wow where has this band been all my life you know that's cool yeah i think you mentioned too i had the little hole a punched hole in the plastic yeah it was (laughs) was in the cutout bin we never had those cutout bins i used to raid those things yeah and they were never in order it was just a big one big mess you know just random you just have to look through it yeah so the last turtles album 1969's turtle soup produced by ray davies of the kinks and uh, it fared slightly better on the charts than battle of the bands number 117 in the u.s you say it's kind of a schizophrenic album now yeah that's fair ray didn't want it to be a a kinks album and the turtles wanted it to be a kinks album and they it just didn't it didn't click I, it's schizophrenic is a great word for that. Yeah, I'm not sure which one of you guys wrote it, but I think what, one of you described it. Maybe it was Mark, schizophrenic. Yeah, because they didn't know what it, they wanted it to be. That's really bottom line. The unfortunate thing is it didn't really have a hit single off of it by that point. You know, you showed me really was their last big hit. And so they had some minor hits and they're good songs, you know, like House on the Hill and You Don't Have to Walk in the Rain, things like that. But it's like they're not not songs people remember. They don't get any airplay nowadays. That was one of my loves of doing this book is Mark was very much more well versed in the Turtles, um, you know, history and discography and all that. And so for me, yeah, I knew all the hits. I knew some of the B-sides. I knew a lot of the stuff that the world may or may not know, unless they're music people. Um, but going into the, the the whole albums and hearing the stuff that was like so many scenarios of how could this not have been a hit? <laughs> That's what I was getting a lot of. And of course, I was also getting a lot of, oh, yeah, I can see why it wasn't a hit because it, yeah. you know, it's so bland. It doesn't have a strong car, so whatever. But that's going to be the case with every recording artist on the planet. But for an act that had so many great hits, the ones that could have been follow-up hits and should have been hits never were. And, and that, that leaves the question mark of, was it the label's fault? Was it a matter of the, you know, the producer? There's no real answer to that. But what the book does a good job of, I think, is pointing out which songs should be known and which songs we understand why they're not as known as they are. And then the end of the turtles, just like that, were in 1969. But it's not just one thing that leads to the end of the band. Management issues, 
lawsuits, label conflicts all play a part. And then there are a few crazy stories involving the band at private parties that are in the book, one at the White House and another where Howard left the stage mid-song. And they don't even talk about this in the Turtles documentary, so it was news to me when I figured it out and found out later by other sources, probably in Howard's autobiography. But, you know, it's like they got to the point where they weren't playing like the big stadiums or the big clubs anymore for some dumb reason. And White Whale was encouraging them to play anywhere and any everywhere. So they'd play like for somebody's, uh, it'd be some rich person and throw them a few thousand dollars and they'd play in the backyard. And so, you know, it just, just, Howard snapped at one point and just said, I'm sick of this. You know, he, he threw every four letter word out there. Sure. <laughs> but he also threw all the pool chairs into the pool and everything. And then he stormed out and left and he intended to quit the band. You know, this was when they were recording turtle soup. So they still went ahead and recorded without him with other, the other turtles taking on lead vocals. When he did return, he wanted to replace those vocals. And they said, uh, 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 my vocals on here. And so a happy thing for fans is that you get to hear all the turtles take on a lead vocal. But for Howard's sake, it was just like, you know? it's just the frustrating. <laughs> yeah, it's like they weren't yeah. being taken seriously anymore. And and I mean, you see, uh, if, if Ray Davies wants to work with him and if Frank Zappa, who's friggin' brilliant, wants to work with these guys, <laughs> They have legitimate skills. The White House story was with the, that was when Nixon was, Nixon was in, in the White House, House right? Yeah. But, yeah. Well, Mark, I'll let you tell the story. But before we do, okay. Eric, what you what you said, they were funny guys. So it's they were taken very seriously by their peers. Springsteen, Mark Bolin, you know, T-Rex, uh, certainly Zappa. They were recognized as great vocalists and people wanted to work with them. But yet I don't think they... And it's odd that Mark would have gotten so upset, um, Howard would have gotten so upset and walked off because they didn't take themselves as seriously as you would think. And if you saw them through the years live, their show was as much comedy as it was music. Mm. Um, you know, right up to, you know, recording Gary Shandling's theme song. Everything with the Turtles tied in with um, humor and personality. And that's that's one of my loves of the the Beatles, the Monkees, the Turtles. Is it's not just music; it's personality, it's comedy, it's you know. Let's what are they going to say and do next? And you know they would make fun of their peers. They would goof on other recording acts. So they never took themselves seriously. I think on stage, but certainly took themselves seriously in the studio. That's why that whole. Howard incident of walking off, you know, had to have been, oh my God, this is you unusual. Know, was, well, yeah. They weren't, they, they weren't appreciating it. it. Like I said, it was some wealthy family. They got the turtles and the turtles were just like background music. Nobody was paying attention to him. Nobody, you know, and that's what yeah. was really kind of angering him. You know, he wanted to performance in front of an appreciative crowd, not people that are like drinking and talking to each other and eating while they're well, <laughs> performing the band, their hits. You know? While the band is treated like a secondary wedding band. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you know, they felt, you know, at least Howard did felt they were better than that, you know, and it's like the White House gig was uh, like almost a different animal. It still was a wealthy <laughs> family, of course, but apparently Trisha Nixon, which was one of Richard Nixon's daughters, said that the turtles was one of her favorite bands and so and checkers uh, too right? somehow, wasn't checkers a big fan <laughs> it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't it the, the dog checkers <laughs> <laughs> so somehow this got back to the uh, white whale the turtles and they got an invite to go and play at the white house and they initially turned it down because they go oh nixon yeah you know and everyone convinced him that it's like well you know it's not really a political thing he's not going to be there it's more kind of honoring your country you know and stuff like that and they kind of said yeah, okay you know on that level i and guess we can do it. it and there is money yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And, and you know the the story and howard and mark tell this very well in the the documentary if you ever have a chance you know but it's like they're all waltzing in with their instruments and everything it's with secret service so they're bringing it in they don't know how to handle things and so they're dropping drum kits and everything and one of them had a metronome inside and started ticking and so they thought it was a bomb <laughs> so they, they told everyone to hit the dirt and, <laughs> oh and then they pulled out the metronome 
it, he pulls out this one lever and it uh, it, it makes an A chord, you know, boo, <laughs> you know, just to, and uh, so everybody thought, oh no, it's going to explode, and so <laughs> they leave, come back with this metronome that's torn apart, and they say, here, it's a metronome. That's and great. I think they paid him a check of seventy five dollars for the broken metronome. <laughs> Most underrated turtle song, in your opinion? Let's start with Mark and then Charles. Most underrated song you're shocked wasn't a hit. Well, it might be because it's like, I love it. Love in the city. Yeah, probably. Oh, I want to give a different angle on the answer. I'm a big surf music guy, Telstar, all that, you know, the ventures. And I thought that the, the stuff that the Crossfires were putting out was maybe not, you know, hit after hit, but certainly on par with the good surf music of the time. And that, I think that was, if someone is listening and say, oh, what, what song should I get to love? There's a few, the surf, there's a bunch, that's actually a bunch, but I, I would say, check out the, the Crossfire stuff because it really is, um, it's a product of its time, but it also holds up. It's fun. Mm. And uh, well, how much of it is available? They out. put out everything on a, a CD. So the singles that I mentioned earlier, they're on there. And I think there's like 15 tracks, including a couple alternate takes. I mean, I think they have everything that they ever did. They even did a Christmas record, Santa and the Sidewalk Surfer. And, so you I know, can- it's, it's a crack up. The Book Done Rock podcast will be back after this. Mark Howard and Charles F. Rosnay, authors of the brand new book titled Not Just Happy Together, The Turtles from A to Z, AM Radio to Zappa, which is where now we're at, Frank Zappa. How did that gig come about? It's the two guys that joined the band. It's Flo and Eddie. Mark and Howard or Flo and Eddie. Yeah. How, how did that all come together? L.A. music scene, everybody knew each other. So, you know, the Zappa, the Monkeys, the Turtles, all these guys were playing together, you know, or knew of each other at the very least. In 69, Zappa disbanded his original Mothers of Invention. They had been together for about five years or something like that. And they were on the payroll, but he wasn't having hits. And he said, why are all these people on my payroll? He's paying them out of his own pocket. So he fired everyone. And then he realized, oh, I want to go on tour again after he did the Hot Rats album. So he assembled a new Mothers of Invention. I think a couple of the members from the old Mothers of Invention came back, if I remember correctly. But he decided on this time out, he wanted some good singers, or at least a good singer. And, you know, like I said, every, he, everybody knows everything. The monkeys were kind of winding down. And so he initially pursued Mickey Dolan's and asked him, and Mickey just said no. <laughs> Man, that would have been he, interesting, huh? <laughs> he wasn't interested in that type of music. Yeah. So, I mean, I, even the monkeys did some crazy sounds and wild things, but I think even that was beyond head and beyond <laughs> what they were doing. Right. So, or maybe his manager said, you know, I don't know the exact story. Maybe his manager said, you don't want to do that. Sap right. So, <laughs> um, in the case of the Turtles, they had nothing to lose. I mean, White Whale was uh, folding up. They were running out of money. The Turtles hadn't had a hit in well over a year. And they were really the bread and butter artist on that label. So they eventually, it, they got to the point where they were like reissuing stuff from the first album like Eve of Destruction, and even charted like a number of hundred and stuff like that. But anyway, on the Zappa side, so he went to Howard Kalen next, and he said, hey, Howard, why would, would you like to be in The Mothers? And and Howard was a Zappa fan. He said, sure, but you got to bring my friend Mark, because we work together. And Zappa was like, mm, okay, you know, and then he thought, yeah, they can do some good harmonies. There's a good reason for this. And so, and it, it's kind of funny, when you're young, Everything seems to take forever. But when you look through the history, they probably were out of work officially maybe like two weeks. Yeah, ain't <laughs> you bad. Know? yeah. But it, you know, musician, when you hear that's them good. The story, you know, it's like, oh, we we're out of commission for like a couple of years and finally Zappa threw us a bone, you know. It's like, no, it was only a couple of weeks, dudes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But anyway. Yeah, it, it, actually, technically there were three guys from the band, right? Because Jim Pons, the bassist yeah. for the Turtles, um, was there he, for the... he didn't he didn't join initially, but uh eventually he did. You yeah. know, it took a few months because he had uh what had happened was they did have a bassist. And uh if you've seen the movie Two Hundred Motels, they actually do a story on that in the movie is 
the basis they had, and I can't think of his name off the top of my head, said, I don't want to play the Zappa's crap music. I want to play good classical music and jazz and other stuff, you know. And so he left. Strangely yeah. enough, he got him to to recreate that for 200 motels, <laughs> you know, but yeah. that's about the time when Pons came in. So they're both in this movie. I haven't and seen 200 motels, but I heard it's bizarre. It, oh. it, it makes magical mystery tour <laughs> look like a straightforward <laughs> picture yes. or head look like a straightforward picture. You yeah. know, it, 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 it's in almost incomprehensible. <laughs> I want to add, he was probably looking at not just people who were musical, but maybe people who had a similar mindset as far as comedy and entertainment. I tell the story. I had some kind of poster from 200 Motels. I think it was probably a, a promo sheet or something. And I went to see Theodore Bikel live. I, Mark, you've probably heard this story. And Theodore Bikel was a very established, you know, highbrow performer, singer and all this and somehow i guess an agent forced him <laughs> into this film and he and i asked i saw theater bacal at the woolsey hall or some uh, highfalutin place and i said can you sign this for me uh please and he went just he just like oh my gosh anything but <laughs> anything but that he dreaded that someone knew that he was in it and that was that was part of his resume <laughs> but yeah, yeah. It's magical mystery tour and and head are you know are sensible classics compared to two hundred motels. Yeah, I still need to see that. And Howard and Mark are on Zappa's nineteen seventy album Chunga's Revenge. Tell yes. me you love me is just a kick ass tune. Yeah, I love that. Song. I mean, that could have been a turtle song. You know, it really yeah. was. You know, they had some songs. Zappa released a lot of weird stuff, but he he had a commercial ear too. I mean. You know, uh, not necessarily with uh, Flo and Eddie, but I mean, you know, later on he did Dance in Full and Valley yep. Girl and things like that. So he had a commercial ear. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then Jim is on the Fillmore East June 1971 album. So all three guys are on that one. And then 1972 is just another band from L.A., also a live yep. album. And then Howard and Mark changed their names because White Whale Records had ownership of their real names. They changed their name to what was it again? They had two roadies, and one of them was known as the fluorescent leech. Right. <laughs> it was later shortened to flow. Interestingly, Howard was originally fluorescent leech, and Mark was Eddie, but somehow it got switched. And so, <laughs> but, uh, you know, they were named after the two roadies. I, I, I reveal who the roadies were in the book, but it was just like an in joke because they couldn't use the name Mark Bowman or Howard Kalen for a time. That's you know, just that, crazy. That, that changed that, that's, later, you know. But the you music know, business is like so nutty. Like I just did an interview with an author who did a book on Moby Grape, and their manager forced them to sign something where he owned the name of the band. So then, when they split ways, the managers going around promoting that are his own Moby Grape, and then there's yeah. the real Moby Grape playing so at the same time. So much nineteen dead. I think the 1910 Fruit Gum Company, a bubble gum band, had the same scenario where, you know, well, it's when the monkeys tour, they have to license their guitar logo. They don't own it. You know, Mickey Dolan's goes out, he's Mickey Dolan's. But if he wants it to be a monkeys tour and they want to use the logo, they're they're paying for it. It's wow. a sim very similar yeah. situation. And they weren't Flo and Eddie, no way were they gonna pay to use the name Turtles. It was just screw it. Yeah. Not, but in this yeah. case, this is the real name. It's like Yeah. You own yeah. my it, name. Well, it's it my in name. The contract. And like <laughs> yeah. I said, you know, they they, they, they by their own admittance, they agreed to everything. They signed anything. They didn't read it. You know, they're kids. You know, they didn't know yeah. what they're doing. Absolutely. You know, and they didn't have lawyers there. Nowadays, you probably have three lawyers around you. Oh, you probably don't want to sign that. Oh, we got to take that out. You know, and they'd be reading it themselves. You know, but back then, you know, sign these kids up quick. They can sing. <laughs> right, right. This incident where Zappa falls off stage during a show in London in 71. This is crazy. He could have died. I mean, I, I mean, the way it's described, like he's he's in the, the orchestra pit looking up. Yeah, they're just staring well, blank. Let's back up a bit. The thing that stopped them first was some guy lit a, a flare 
when they were performing, and that became the basis for Deep Purple's Smoke on the Water. Right. You know, and the venue burned down, plus their instruments, so they had nothing. And Zappa asked, well, do you want to continue? And most of them said, yeah, we got to continue. So the next gig was in England, in London somewhere. And Oh, that was uh, the next gig it, after that the was Montreux? The next gig. It was like a week later, and they... they rented instruments because they didn't have their own they're burnt up wow, and uh, poor it's Frank, the very huh? next gig and so here they're starting to perform again hey you know we're back on track blah 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 and then at the very end of the show and there's audio recording of this you know some jealous guy thought that zappa was flirting with his girlfriend off stage <sighs> and so he rushed the stage at the end pushed him into the orchestra pit he fell 30 feet or something like that yeah and, and he's uh, like he's in the orchestra pit with like <laughs> His leg is all bent and his yeah, arms are you know, all... it's like the, you know, the, they all say, you know, it looked like he was dead and he wasn't, but he was in a wheelchair for uh, like a year and right. he certainly couldn't tour. And so that basically ended the Flo and Eddie version of the Zappa Mothers. Yes. So. Right. That's where Flo and Eddie starts. They released a handful of studio albums from 72 to 81. What are your personal highlight songs or albums from those years? The first one, which is called The Fluorescent Leech and Eddie, it came out in 72. If you get the CD booklet, it even says in there that they went to them. They were on reprise records by this point. And they asked them, do you want to put this out as a Turtles album or a Flo and Eddie album? And it it could have been another Turtles album. But for some reason, everybody kind of agreed that Turtles were old news by 1972. Uh, Flo and Eddie are hot off of being with Zappa for a couple of years. Let's continue with that name. I don't know if it was the shrewdest move. You know, I, I, I think they could have put it out under the real names. By that point, they they probably had the rights to the real names, Mark and Howard, you know, or some variation thereof, or even come up with a new name. Flo and Eddie's not very catchy, <laughs> but they did what they did. And it's a very good album. Like all the Flo and Eddie albums, there's a couple weird comedy cuts that are kind of goofy <laughs> you know on the second album which is called flow and eddie they have this one called carlos and the bull and they do these bad mexican accents oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> you they know? Had their so, own talk show for a while didn't they oh yeah they had a radio yeah, show uh, yeah, radio, sure. the first yeah. time i ever heard the name flow and eddie was just seeing kit a uh, gene and paul from kiss during music from the elder era 1980 yeah and it's yeah. a surreal interview where, like, they're just, they're all being goofy. You know, Gene and Paul are being goofy and Flo and Eddie are being goofy. I was like, who are, who are these guys, Flo and Eddie? <laughs> There's this box set that uh, Rhino put out that's long out of print, but if you can find it, it's really good. We talk about it in the book called The History of Flo and Eddie and the Turtles. And they have various sound clips from the radio show. They have Ringo on there and Harry Nielsen and Alice Cooper, uh, Keith Moon, all sorts of different things. He, they actually got the move together, which is Jeff Lynn's group before ELO. Oh, yeah. And he, they tricked them into arriving at the studio together so that they would reunite. It's like, you know, I go, why, why didn't ever, anybody think of that with the Beatles to get them together? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, but they got the move together and they were a little bit just out of sorts but then they agreed to be interviewed well we're here now you know so. yeah the <laughs> so. sound of Flo and eddie is it vastly different from the turtles is it is it similar now we're into the 70s so just yeah, the I mean, sound of the time sound but i mean yeah. you know it, ones that sound good that should have been hits like let me make love to you rebecca you know things like that they had that sound you know they had the harmonies you know still because mark and howard just knew how to sing together Howard is a, you know, an underrated, great lead vocalist. And somehow Mark, you know, you, you hear Mark nowadays, it's, you have to discount it, you know, because years later and, he, you know, it's taken a toll, it's hard for him to sing. But back then he was, his harmonies were great. They were spot on and, and together they blended so beautifully. What you, I wanted to touch on what you guys discussed, you know, he, they were on reprise records, which was Sinatra's label. I mean, this was a major label. I don't think it was an issue for them to have gotten the name Turtles and used it at that point. I just right. think they were so, it's, this is the past, you know, that was the 60s. We want to move ahead. And they did move ahead sound-wise because it was, you know, whatever, it's five, 10 years later. But yet it's you still hear the sound. You still hear the vocals. And if you play a Turtle song with a Flo and Eddie first album or second album song, you 
you can see the symmetry. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You talk about the vocals. They did backing vocals on some of the biggest albums. I'm looking here. T-Rex, Steely Dan, Keith Moon solo album, Stephen Stills, Alice Cooper. They are doing backing vocals on Springsteen's Hungry Heart. Heart, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Blondie. Paul Cantner. Yeah, it's the American album, the Blondie one. That's the one with the tide is high and rapture. And they're on right, there. <laughs> right. Jefferson Airplane in 1989. Duran Duran, that mm-hmm. mid nineties album. Thank you. Yeah. And then they recorded children's albums. How did that all come about? <laughs> well, we'll back up a little bit. Um, yep. So 200 motels had an animated segment in it. It was like, uh, if I remember correctly, one of the characters' head trips. You know, it's like, and so it was animated by this company called Murazaki Wolf, and they ended up animating like Nielsen's The Point. If you have ever seen that special, and they did a special with Marlo Thomas called Free to Be You and Me, and they later were doing specials with character Strawberry Shortcake and the Care Bears, which were American Greetings characters. So. Flo and Eddie knew these guys and vice versa. And so they invited them to write and sing new songs. And they did, you know. So, you know, they write songs like Here Come the Care Bears and introduce them all. You know, here's Happy Bear, here's Sad Bear, whatever. I don't know the Care Bears names, (laughs) you know. Or, you know, the Strawberry Shortcake theme. Here comes Strawberry, you know, that type of thing. And kids ate it up they didn't know who Flo and eddie were they don't know who the turtles were but those are good kids songs and i like strawberry shortcake so i'm playing this record <laughs> so that's it and then they how many albums did they put out children i think they albums. did five each of those characters they did a gi joe storyteller album you know with the the you know gi joe da, 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 you know in the the 80s version of gi joe with that had an animated series and they did a, a Gumby compilation where Gumby. various singers would sing songs about Gumby. And it was marketed <laughs> on Disney Records. They got Frank Sinatra Jr. to do a song. They got uh, Dweezil and Moon Unit Zappa to do a song. And Flo and Eddie did a song about Gumby that sounds like I'm the Walrus. It has the same kind of oh, you know, <laughs> so sound to you it. Mentioned. Mark, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Back when, Eric, when you asked what one song should the world know, Yep. It's that it's that Gumby song. It's it's it outruddles the ruddles. It's like the most Beatles non beatles song there is. That Gumby song. Oh, is that on Spotify? Because I put together a playlist for each episode. <laughs> is it is it on Spotify? You think? Um, I, it should be. I mean, I'll get you the name of the the, the exact probably. name of the song. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. Let's Gumby, see here. the Blockheads, yeah. Hokey, they're <laughs> legends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, awesome. the official title is we all uh, are gumby we yeah. are gumby we all are gumby yeah, yeah. we yeah. all are gumby yeah, yeah gumby had a gumby had there was a resurgence for gumby i remember in the 90s or no was the 80s, they used to, yeah they used to play it after yeah. school. i remember coming home from school in the mid 80s and watching it and, and to make yeah. a connection even stronger with the beatles uh, that album came out with a green cover that looks like the white album, but instead of saying the Beatles, it said Gumby. <laughs> oh my God. That's great. <laughs> that's great. Hey, and speaking of the eighties, they brought back the turtles, right? Howard, Howard and Mark, they brought it back after some legal battles, but Howard retired in 2018. However, Mark still continues with Ron Dante of the Archies. Yeah. He's missed a few shows, Mark, for health reasons. But when you go see the happy together tour, they're the headliners. It's Ron Dante doing Howard's parts because Howard's done. Mark still does comedy, but Ron plays it straight, does the songs exactly note for note as they were. And it's still great. It keeps the music alive. Mark still keeps the personality and comedy alive. And people who go, you know, they they know, I think they know they're not seeing the original Five Turtles, but that's how it is with every band, whether it's grassroots, whoever you're going to see now, you know, the Monkees is Mickey, you know, different bands is different people. But as long as Mark's out there, it still gives that. I don't know if it will continue beyond, you know, when Mark actually, you know, hangs it up and stops playing. If Ron Dante of the Archies will then be the Turtles with the band that they play with now, we don't know. But right, since about 2018, the Happy Together tour, aside from COVID when it stopped for a little while, has been, it's been for since the 80s, uh, Happy Together. (laughs) And we had the privilege of interviewing most of the people who played with the Turtles 
when they were the turtles, when they were post turtles, and right up on through their touring years. A lot of the musicians who uh, they had a West Coast and an East Coast band on sometimes for financial reasons. It made sense to have a group playing when they played their California gigs and their New York area gigs. And now when it's a happy together tour, it's one band that backs up, whether it's the councils or the association or the Vogue's or whoever is on the bill, it's the Turtles band backing everybody else up. And the book, Not Just Happy Together, The Turtles from A to Z, AM Radio to Zappa is out now. And you can find it wherever books are sold, right? Amazon, all the places that you usually get your books. And then people can also find you guys. You're all over the place. Let's start. Actually, Mark, we'll start with your, your podcast. You've had a lot of the guys from the Turtles. Yeah, I mean, if you want to hear the interviews fun ideas uh, uncut and everything with Charles and I, I mean, they're on the Fun Ideas podcast, which I've done since about 2018. Originally, I didn't know who I was going to interview on my podcast. I just was doing my normal interviews and then i said hey i can make this work double duty i can interview somebody and then that interview can work for my books coming soon i have a two volume mad magazine history book called uh, unconditionally mad well i interviewed a lot of the mad guys and so those are on different episodes so it's not all music for me it's all my just various interests tv yeah. movies animation whatever so <laughs> i am a subscriber i listen yeah. <laughs> i listen regularly and charles people could find you online social media the beatles tours whatever you want to <laughs> all over the place you yeah know, I'm like, like manure you just spread everywhere <laughs> but, um, I, I will tell you that we want to do a shout out to genius books who put out this amazing edition this it's a hardcover it's really almost 500 pages it's really a beautiful job that they did yeah. with a cover by henry diltz the front cover and back cover <laughs> rock photographer henry diltz <laughs> <laughs> from the Doors and the Monkeys and the Beatles. We got a nice forward from Gary Puckett, Gary Puckett and Union Gap. The book is, as you said, in all the places, all the normal, usual suspects, but the website for it is www.notjusthappytogether.com. Okay. Then you can order straight from there. And yeah, I do the Beatle tours, liverpooltours.com. If people want to come to uh, the Holy Land, Liverpool and London with me. I want to go. I want to go. Oh, I am yeah. going. We, we're, we were just talking before we started. To, we st Just before we started recording, we were talking about they're going to make biopics on each of the four guys in the Beatles. You got to be looking forward to that. So exciting. And the other thing we're looking forward to, aside from Mark's mad book, is another book with an M in it. Uh, him and I, hey, Mark and I are working on a monkey's collection that's going to be coming out uh, hopefully before the end of the year. So we'll let you know all about that one as well. Excellent. What me worry? Mad Magazine. <laughs> classic. Classic. Is, is Mad Magazine still going? They... It's still going. It's a reprint book now. They have occasional, they have new covers. Uh, like the, late, the latest issue has Taylor Swift and uh, her boyfriend, the football player, <laughs> Travis. Kelsey, yeah, yeah. Kelsey, yeah. I couldn't think of his name off the top of my head. I'm like, <laughs> Mr. Swift. <laughs> right. <laughs> Mr. Swift. Exactly. And he wants to fans. Um, oh, but, it, you know, it's a funny, it's a funny, timely cover. So they still try to keep up. They still occasionally have a new article here and there, and they have have new fold-ins and stuff like that so they try but you know I, I hope for at some point that they will come back but you know at least they're being published so yeah looking forward to that book thanks for being on guys thank you so yeah. much for having us thank you that's it it's in the books